Hello, welcome back to the FDR Library's Hudson Valley History Reading Festival. Um, I'm Paul Sparrow. I'm the director here at the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, it's been a great day so far. We've had some fascinating talks. Uh, we're now about to uh, our final speaker for the day. Uh, he's been a part of the Hudson Valley Reading Festival for many years, Anthony P. Musso. Uh, his most recent book is Hidden Treasures of the Hudson Valley, Volume 3, which of course means there are two earlier volumes. And Tony is, uh, has really done a fantastic job of, of exploring and explaining the Hudson Valley. Uh, he's been a writer and editor for a number of publications throughout his career. Uh, worked for Postal Headquarters, served as the media spokesman and editor uh, for 85,000 Circulation Monthly Magazine. Uh, he worked as a freelance correspondent for the Times Herald Record in Middleton, a journalist and weekly columnist with Gannett Newspapers. Uh, he still is involved with them. He's written eight books, including the three volumes about the hidden treasure of the Hudson Valley. Uh, Tony, it's always a pleasure to uh, see you and to share the spotlight with you. I wish we could be in person uh, at the library. Hopefully we will again soon, but uh, thank you for joining us today and the stage is yours. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for inviting me again. I believe this is my fifth appearance at the festival, and it's a very important festival to me because, as you know, I'm very passionate about the history of the Hudson Valley. Today, I'm going to be speaking about volume three of my Hidden Treasures of the Hudson Valley book series. For those of you uh, that aren't familiar with the series, each volume features 55 sites that while they're under most of them, the mainstream tourist radar and some off the beaten path completely, um, they have significant ties to local and uh, national history. Uh, what I did with the book is after the, you read the history of each individual site, I try to encourage day trips to these sites. Uh, and so I provide a physical address or driving directions, and where applicable, I also put a website or uh, telephone contact information to encourage uh, readers to go out and visit these sites. A lot of them are run by historical societies or municipalities, and high levels of visitation will ensure that they stay open and, and viable. Uh, you can make a nice day trip, a weekend trip, or even more, because there's so many wonderful sites throughout the area. I'm going to start with the uh, site that's featured on the front cover of my book, and uh, that is called Caramar. It is in Katona, New York. Slide. Next slide. Caramar, in 1938, Carolyn Hoyt had put her 100-acre property in Katona on the market. At the same time, a well-known international banker and attorney named Walter Rosen and his wife, Lucy, who lived primarily in New York City, were looking for a country property that they can go to on weekends and during the summer months. Well, as it turns out, Walter Rosen's business partner was, was Carolyn Hoyt's son, and uh, the Rosens visited the property, fell in love with it, and they purchased it. The only thing they weren't fond of was that Carolyn Hoyt had a very modest arts and crafts house on the property that she used. And they took that down and replaced it with this magnificent Mediterranean revival villa. As you can see, it has a red tile roof. Uh, it has a courtyard in the center of the structure. And just beyond that, uh, that tree line there uh, is an archway. That's the front entrance to the house. You would go into the archway and the door to the house is on the left. If you continued straight ahead, you would go right into the courtyard and every room on the first floor of the villa had doors leading into the courtyard. So that was additional access. Um, the largest space in the residence, next slide, is called the music room. And next slide, thank you. And the next uh, is music room, which spans 40 feet by 80 feet and has a 30 foot high ceiling. It features French and Swiss stained glass windows. And this served as the entertainment place when the Rosens had company. So compare it with our living rooms today, but on a much grander scale, obviously. 
Um, the Rosens were very big art enthusiasts. And so they filled the house with a lot of beautiful paintings and the grounds have a lot of sculptures that they acquired through the years. Now, in addition to the music room, uh, throughout the house, there are four specific rooms that are designed, furnished, and have paintings reflective of a, a European country. And those countries are uh, Italy, France, Spain, and England. And they're just wonderful to look at all the furnishings and everything and the rugs and the rooms, everything reflects uh, those, uh, those countries. The grounds include several gardens, a tennis pavilion and gazebos. One of the gardens is a magnificent sunken garden that was originally established by Carolyn Hoyt, but the Rosens greatly expanded. Now, when the Rosens received word in 1944 that their son had died in battle during World War II, they decided immediately to bequeath the property to make it become a center for the music and arts after their deaths. Walter Rosen died in 1951, and Lucy Rosen died in 1968. In 1971, the Caramore Center for Music and Arts opened. Now, anyone that lives in the Hudson Valley region might have heard of Caramore, but specifically because of its uh, music festival that they have every summer. Uh, of all genres, they have opera, classical music, jazz, blues. Uh, they have a big tent on the property. They do some more intimate performances in the sunken garden. And they also use the courtyard for different concerts. Well, what a lot of people might not be aware of is this magnificent house is open for public tours. You can actually go out there on a day trip, tour the house, stroll the grounds. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful property and it's kept as such today. There are also special events besides the music festival. Say you and a few friends wanted to go and visit the house, tour the house, and then stay for a high tea, have some tea and crumpets. They have special events like that. Their website is at the end of the chapter, and you could certainly uh, access that and request the catalog be sent to you, and all future events are in that catalog. And uh, you'll be aware of it and maybe want to save your trip for a day when there's something special going on. Next slide. The next site that we're going to visit is also in Westchester. It's in Hastings on Hudson, and that's the Jasper Cropsey House. During the 19th century, Jasper Cropsey was one of the most renowned painters associated with the Hudson River School of Art, which is very famous today, having a very big resurgence. He began his career as an architectural apprentice, but in 1843, Cropsey started painting watercolors and oil paintings, landscapes. He did that for the National Academy of Design. And the following year, 1844, he had his first exhibit of paintings there. It went so well and it was so well received and his paintings sold that he gave up architecture and went, went full time into being a landscape uh, painter. His first art exhibition, uh, like I said, was a great success and he got a lot of fame out of that. He was primarily known for his lavish use of color and breathtaking landscape scenes. Uh, Cropsey married Maria Cooley in 1847, and the couple spent the next two years in Europe studying various art styles in Italy, France, Switzerland, and England. And upon returning back to the United States, he opened a gallery in New York City and was extremely successful. So much so that in 1869, he leaned back on his architectural background and he designed a beautiful 29 room Borden Batten mansion in Warwick, Orange County. Uh, he christened the home and the estate Aladdin. Unfortunately, by the 1880s, as often happens in art, you go through different phases and his style and those of other Hudson uh, River School artists were falling out of fashion. And unfortunately, Cropsey was forced to sell the majority of his paintings for pennies on the dollar. He had a seller's mansion and all its furnishings. And he and his wife downsized and they moved to the east side of the Hudson River to Hastings. 
In Hastings, they rented a house for one year before purchasing this house, which was built in 1835. It was 50 years old at the time. And Cropsey added on an art studio to replicate the one he had in, in uh, Warwick. And it's, it's worth the whole trip to the house just to see the art studio. Um, Cropsey uh, named the house Everest. And he and his wife remained here for the re uh, rest of their lives. Uh, Jasper Cropsey died in 1900 at 77 years old. And his wife Maria died six years later. Now, the Cropsies had daughters, and one of their daughters tragically was killed in a car accident with her husband in California. But the Cropsies took in their granddaughter, Isabel, and raised her in this house. And after their deaths, Isabel had married a multi-term mayor of Hastings and remained here for her lifetime and her husband's. And there was a lot of entertaining here uh, due to her husband's profession. Um, in, they lived here probably through the 1970s. In 1977, Jaspie's, uh, Cropsey's great-granddaughter, Barbara Newington, who now lives on, in Southern Connecticut, her and her husband were well off and they were going into New York City to purchase a lot of her great-grandfather's paintings. Unfortunately, they weren't on display because the, the Hudson River School of Movement had gone in through a lull and they were stored away and they were able to buy the paintings for 50 and $100 each. Today, they go for five and $10,000 each. And they stored more than 200 paintings on their property out in Westport, Connecticut. In uh, 1977, she founded the Newington Cropsey Foundation with two goals in mind. One was to preserve this house and the other was to keep her great grandfather's artwork in the forefront of art enthusiast minds. You can go for a public tour in this house and a lot of his watercolors are displayed between the, all the different rooms in the house. And I've taken five uh, bus trips down to this house. I do hidden treasures of the Hudson Valley bus tours. And when you get in front of that front door and you turn around and look west, you're looking right at the Hudson River and in the distance, Orange County. It's just a magnificent sight to, to see. Now, in 1944, Barbara Newington opened up the uh, Gallery of Art, the Jasper Cropsey uh, Gallery of Art. Next slide. And that is where they put all of the paintings that they had stored in Connecticut. This is only one small wing, and obviously I took this slide because it's very well lit, but there are over 200 uh, paintings of Jasper Cropsey. Now, the wonderful thing about this whole thing is the tour by reservation only and the visit to the art gallery are absolutely free of charge. The Newington uh, Cropsey Foundation pays for the tour guides and everything else, and it's uh, really, if you're into art, this is a very worthwhile place to go. And of course, that information on where you would call to reserve, you don't have to be a bus group. You could be five people that just want to go and look at the house and take a tour, but you have to do it by reservation only. And that's at the end of the chapter. Next slide. We're going to go across the bridge now into Orange County to visit the 1950. Uh, Chester Railroad Station for the uh, New York and Erie Railroad line. In 1834, the New York State Legislative was persuaded to authorize the construction of the New York and Erie Railroad. It originated in the a town of Piedmont, which is in Rockland County, just a few miles south of the Tappan Zee Bridge. And it went up 400 miles to Dunkirk, which is located on Lake Erie. Uh, it, as construction moved forward without any issues, when the line reached the village of Chester, they had to contend with what the locals called black dirt. Black dirt are meadows that are basically huge swamps. And the workers were forced to drive about 100 piles, 50 feet down into the ground just to support the weight of the tracks and the subsequent trains that were going to be over it. Next slide. In 1841, the first station built on the line was in Chester. 
And Chester and the town of Goshen became the first stations to have full-time agents associated there. The first passenger train arrived in Chester later that year, 1841. Next slide. And the most prominent passenger you can see seated here with a blanket over his legs was Secretary of State Daniel Webster. Now, Daniel Webster refused to sit in a passenger car and he preferred having a rocking chair put on a flatbed car. And his, his reasoning was that he can better enjoy the scenery. His political opponents and his critics claimed that he only did it to be better noticed. Well, I don't know which story is true, but I can say that right after this happened, a lot of politicians were using trains to campaign and give speeches off the back of the train, crisscrossing the country. So he may have started a trend there. Next slide. The dairy industry was a driving factor to railroad success. And in 1842, the first shipment of 240 quarts of milk left Chester destined for New York City. By 1900, approximately 7,000 quarts of milk annually were shipped from Orange County down to New York City, and it became a huge boom for Orange County dairy farmers. Next slide. As passenger, uh, passenger numbers grew on the railroad, they replaced the 1841 station with this new station in 1915. They moved the wooden station, the previous one, next door. And from that time forward, it was just a freight depot. Um, now, what happened as automobiles came into play and more and more families were able to afford automobiles and get automobiles and also highways, parkways, throughways, were leading to everywhere a family could ever want to go, instead of being restricted to just visit sites on a rail line, many railroads across the nation closed down. Well, the same thing happened here in, in Chester, and eventually towards the 80s, this station, the last train that went through was strictly freight. It had no passengers on board, and then the line shut down, the building was closed and abandoned. The Chester Historical Society formed in 1964, and in 1984, they acquired this building. Its members worked tirelessly to restore the interior and exterior of the building, and they opened a wonderful history museum inside it now. That's opened every Saturday uh, from May through October from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You can see original artifacts from the uh, New York and Erie uh, Railroad line in there, as well as exhibits on Chester history. There is another chapter in the book about a tavern that's only a five minute uh, drive from this site that you could visit the same day. And that tavern was very famous. It had a famous trial there. Uh, with two attorneys, you might be uh, aware of, uh, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. The tavern was also the meeting house of a local militia where they met before they went off to battle. So there are a lot of sites like this that go through the country. And again, this site, like many in my book, are open from May to October. While this is free admission, the Historical Society gratefully accepts any donations you leave there. Next slide. Last slide I'm going to show you in Orange County is the Hillhold Farmstead. Built in 1869, this was the home of prosperous Orange County farmer Thomas Bull. Now, Thomas Bull was the fourth of 12 children born to William and Sarah Bull, who coincidentally had their own beautiful stone house on 100 acres a short distance away from this. And that can be visited, too. What I try to do in the book is if you're going to take a drive of any significance, I try to give you two or three sites within a 20 minute drive of each other so you can make a day trip out of it. And uh, that's the case with uh, the William Bull house. Now, in 1724, William Bull, the father, was loyal to the crown and he petitioned King George I for additional land. In return, he was given 500 acres. And when he died in 1755, that land was divided equally between Thomas Bull and his brother, William Bull. 
Now you might say, well, wait a minute, you just told me there were 12 siblings in that family. And that's true. But at that time, during that era, land was never transferred to a female member of the family. Don't kill the messenger. In between planting crops, Thomas Bull planned to build this stately house to reflect his family's wealth. And following the lead of his parents, uh, Thomas and his wife raised 12 children in this house. Uh, the interior uh, paneling on the first floor in the house was imported from England and the newels on the central hall staircase right inside the front door were made of mahogany. Uh, it, it has uh, wide plank floors, several fireplaces, and it was built of native limestone. It was really a showpiece for its time. Uh, now, there's an interesting story because Thomas, like his father, was very loyal to the crown, and he was imprisoned several times during the American Revolution for refusing to sign the Articles of Association pledging loyalty to our country. Interestingly, as much as a loyalist he was, his wife was a staunch patriot who wanted independence. So there must have been some very spirited conversations over the dinner table in this house at night. Now, during the 19th century, the house became known as the Bull Jackson House because Civil War Captain William A. Jackson was born in this house. During that period, there were also a number of wood frame buildings put up. You could see one right on the right side of the house in the slide as, as dairy barns and different uh, things of that nature. Every building that was on that property is still in existence today. After the last of the bull descendants left the property in the 1960s, the officials in Orange County, Orange County made a wise move. They knew the historical significance of this property and the county purchased the property, structures and all. Um, it opened it up as the Hill Hole Museum, which today is open to the public. Last bus trip I took here was $3 a person to get in. You get a wonderful tour of the house and you could uh, go on the grounds. Next slide. Because it was a county property, they also took a one-room schoolhouse for another part of Orange County and relocated it here. And that's usually where we started our tours, where you get a really nice lesson about how a single teacher taught eight grade levels in one single room and how the students were made to transfer from desk to desk, depending on what school grade level lesson was being taught. It's a, a very interesting place to visit and well worth your time. Um, next slide. While most of the sites in the book are open May through October, as is this one, they open up the month of December and they give holiday candlelight tours. So you might want to take that in. It's a nice tradition to kick off the holiday season and you'll be going through. Uh, th this property gives a very unique perspective to what life was like on an 1830s uh, farm in Orange County and uh, I think you'd enjoy it very much. Next slide. We are going to leave Orange County and we're going to Ulster County now, specifically the hamlet of Milton in the town of Marlboro. Now, if you know anything about the, pac the pacifism embraced by the members of the Religious Society of Friends, better known as the Quakers to us, uh, you will know that the words fighting and Quakers are not are very rarely used in the same sentence. Well, I titled the chapter The Fighting Quakers of Milton because that accurately uh, demonstrates the actions taken by two brothers in Milton and a cousin who were all devout Quakers, but they all picked up arms and joined the military to battle the southern states. Edward and John Ketchum were born and raised in Milton, devout Quakers, highly educated, they, they were brought up on a farm in Milton, and they had extremely strong feelings about the battle to abolish slavery. They were encouraged to join the war effort during the Civil War by their cousin, Captain Nehemiah Halleck Mann, who was already serving with the 120th Regiment out of Kingston, and he was writing them frequent uh, letters encouraging them to join the effort. 
Now, these siblings originally wanted one of them to stay behind to help out on the mother's farm. She was a recent widow. So Edward, being the oldest brother, was the first to join. He joined in July 1862, and he joined the newly formed uh, Ulster County Regiment. He did a lot of battle. He was involved in a lot of battles. Next slide. And he ended up in the fierce Battle of Gettysburg. According to existing documents, his commanding officer advised him to remain undercover as much as possible, to which Edward Ketchum replied, a dead man is better than a living coward. Well, tragically, as he uttered that last word, he was shot in the forehead and killed instantly. Now, five months prior to that happening, his younger brother, John Ketchum, was getting a little antsy on the farm, and he went out and he joined Company M of the 4th New York Cavalry out of Manhattan. Like his brother Edward, he served as a second lieutenant due to his education level, and he was involved in numerous battles down south until he was deemed too exhausted to serve anymore, and he was sent to a seminary hospital in Washington, D.C. Now, what's incredible to me is that Maria Ketchum, his mother, got into a horse and buggy and went in the middle of the Civil War by herself from Milton. She traveled down to Washington, D.C. to personally care for her surviving son. When he recovered, she returned to the farm in Milton, and he was assigned to a regiment in Virginia. Unfortunately, he and 23 other Union Army soldiers were captured by the Confederates. Next slide. And they were confined in a very notorious Libby prison in Richmond, Virginia. This prison was well known for its filth and its disease. And unfortunately, John Ketchum succumbed to a combination of his own failing health and the disease prevalent in this prison. Uh, sometime after the war ended, Maria Ketchum once again went by herself down south, retrieved both her son's bodies, next slide, and brought them back to Milton, where she buried them side by side in one of two still existing Quaker cemeteries. Now, I should say, Milton was a very, very critical stop on the Underground Railroad. And uh, they had many, many Quakers. They had actually three different Quaker meeting houses. Today, there are no Quakers existing anymore in Milton, but there are the two cemeteries still there. This one is the smaller of the two. And for those of you that know the area, it's located along 9W in Milton. When it comes to the intersection of Willow Tree Road, you can't see it from the road. You have to drive around and up a knoll to get into it and then it's perfectly visible. About 10 feet from the, the two brothers, the Ketchum brothers' graves, is the grave of uh, their cousin, who was also killed in battle during the Civil War. Next slide, Captain Nehemiah Halleck Mann. And his grave marker is distinctive in that it's topped with a, a stone captain's hat on it. Next slide. The last stop we're going to make in Ulster County as we move along is in Kingston, and this is the Stonehouse intersection. The four corners at the intersection of Crown and John Street in Kingston have the distinction of being the only intersection in the United States to have four 18th century stone st uh, structures on each corner. They were all constructed prior to the American Revolution, and they each sustained serious damage when the British attacked the, the settlement back in 1777. Because Kingston was the capital of New York State at the time, it was a primary target for the British. And they burned down virtually or, or did serious fire damage to just about every structure in the settlement. All four structures on this intersection were eventually repaired and, and revised after the attack uh, subsided and the British left. The house on the right is the one and a half story Franz Rogan house on the northeast corner. Following the attack, 
the front part of that house was completely destroyed and Franz Rogan did not have the financial wherewithal to repair it immediately. So there was a little vacant lot in front of his, the remainder of his house. Well, the officials claimed it as public land and they built gallows where spies were hung on the property during the remainder of the war. Now, when Franz Rogan got the money enough to complete his house as it looks today, unfortunately, even though he owned that land to begin with, and it was deemed public property now, he was made to pay 10 pounds, seven shillings to get it back again. Well, obviously he wasn't too happy about that. Before the officials could come and dismantle the gallows, he sent his sons out, they dismantled it. And to this day in the house, the ceiling beams and some of the interior woodwork are from the gallows that were used on that piece of property. Next slide. Going across the street from uh, that house, we're gonna go to the Matthew Pearson house on the left here. It is on the southeast corner and it was repaired immediately after the British left. It was used as a public house or a tavern, if you will, and the family had an apartment in the back of the house. In 1820, Dr. John Goodwin purchased the house and he practiced out of his house. He had a medical office in those two front windows there. And again, the family lived in the back of the house in an apartment. Dr. Goodwin also built a wing on the house around the corner on Crown Street, which he opened as a pharmacy. So the normal practice was you would go in the front door of the residence, go in his office, be treated. He'd write a prescription. And as you came out and walked around the corner, he would take his physician's hat off, put his pharmacist's hat on, race through the house, and he'd serve you there. It was one-stop shopping, perhaps a precursor to Walmart. Who knows? Across the street, you can see, across the street from Pearson's house, you can see a very, very important building in the history of New York. It was built in 1774 and opened as the Kingston Academy, a very prestigious school. It was the first academy to open in New York State, and it counts among its graduates, uh, then future New York State Governor DeWin Clinton. Now, when the uh, Kingston Centralized School District came together, they absorbed the Kingston Academy. And then it went on to become a uh, workshop, store, and family home for a cabinet maker. And following that, the Kingston Daily Leader Weekly newspaper operated out of that building. Next slide. Across the street from the Kingston Academy is the oldest building of the four. It's a two-story Matthew Jansen house that was built in 1700 at 43 Crown Street. After being repaired and rebuilt after the British attack, uh, it went through a series of private owners. The first was a delegate to the New York State Constitutional Convention. Next, there was a state senator that owned it. And then a dentist bought the house and he had his practice on the first level and his family lived up on the second level. I would highly encourage you to visit this area. It's called the Stockade District in Kingston. And the reason it's a Stockade District is that when there were hostilities and a lot of tension between Native Americans and settlers, they built a 13 hundred foot fence, stockade fence, 14 feet high around the whole settlement. While that fence is no longer standing, the area is still known as the stockade district. You can easily spend a full day here. You see the, the stone house intersection. You could visit the Senate house where for $3, they will give you a tour of the modest home that New York state government was founded in and where the Senate met. You could then visit their museum and see all the artifacts and paintings from that era. Then you can go to visit the old Dutch church, which was visited by George Washington during the revolution. And he wrote a letter to the congregation following the war, which is now mounted and framed into uh, the vestibule of the church. Right across the street from the church is the historic Ulster County Courthouse, most famous for being with a trial where freed slave Sir Jonah Truth successfully petitioned the court to get her son back from slavery. When New York freed the slaves, 
His owner illegally sold him to an owner down south, and she won his freedom and got him back. So it's a, a really, really nice place to visit. And like I said, you could easily spend a full day there. There were restaurants in, in the uh, stockade district that you could also take a break with. Okay, next slide. We are going to cross across the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge, and we're going to go to Germantown, New York. And in 1710, approximately 3,000 German Palatines received free passage to this country on 10 British ships for free of charge in exchange for their promise to work to support the Royal Navy. Well, they settled on both sides of the river and in what is now Germantown was named East Camp. In the 1720s, well, let me back up. When it became apparent within two years, actually, that they could not do the work that they promised to do for the Royal Navy because they just didn't have the supplies they needed to do so, the British Parliament basically stopped supporting them financially. And the uh, Palatine spread all throughout the Hudson Valley. Many became tenant farmers. Um, in East Camp, four villages were formed, and those four villages actually were what was merged into what we now know as the town of Germantown. In the 1720s, the German Palatines built a German Reformed Sanctity Church, and in 1746, two blocks from the church, they built this uh, parsonage to house the resident pastor. The first one to live in this house was the Reverend Caspar Ludwig Schnorr. Now, in 1767, they added on the east side of the building a little uh, addition. It's very easy to tell the difference between the two additions because in the original parsonage, the exterior walls are three feet thick. Um, the addition is basically a brick-filled brick wood frame building. And subsequent pastors at the church lived in this parsonage well into the 17th century when it was eventually sold into private hands and became a private residence. In 1944, Friedel and Edward Eckert, who came from Long Island, purchased the house and they embarked on many, many restorations. Probably the most significant restoration was the original door, the front entrance to the house was on the lower level. They replaced it with a window and moved the door up and put a stoop, making actually the original first floor a basement now. They poured a concrete basement floor and they put stucco on the exterior of the front facade of the uh, original part of the parsonage. In the 1919s, getting into old age, the Eckerts donated the house to the town of Germantown. And today it houses the office for the town historian, Germantown's historian. The interior still uh, features its original beams, built-in cabinets, and a huge fireplace on the lower level. And it also has an extensive exhibit that is in the building from a years long dig that was done by an archeologist from nearby Bard College. The house, unlike other sites in the book, is not only open from May to October, it's open year round every Saturday from nine to noon. And I can guarantee you, if you show up there on a Saturday from nine to noon, the town of Sora will be more than happy to show you every artifact in the building. On the dig, they found original pewter silverware, china plates, pieces of dolls, and everything else is very interesting to go. And again, that's free of charge. So if you're going to be coming to the area, you might want to, on a Saturday, you might want to start off right there before you visit all the other wonderful sites that we have. Next slide. Now, because uh, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library is co-sponsoring today's event with the Poughkeepsie Library District, I thought it was appropriate to end my lecture in the town of Hyde Park and tell you a little bit about the history of it. This is the one acre family cemetery of the Stoutenberg family. It was established in 1768, and today it remains one of two parcels 
that are still owned by descendants of the first family to have settled in this town. Very well known in the area, we know it as Hyde Park, New York, but the first name of this community was known as Stoutenburg, New York, or Stoutenburg Landing. Born in New York City in, eight, in 1696, Jacobus Stoutenburg was the first person to settle here. He built the house in 1741 on what is now the middle of West Market Street in Hyde Park. And the part that's West Market Street was originally a path, a driveway, if you will, although horse and buggies, off of the King's Highway that led to his house. The King's Highway, of course, is today known as Route 9, major thoroughfare in the area. Stoutenberg was a merchant, farmer, and judge who acquired a massive amount of property in the region. And with one of his son-in-laws, Major Richard de Cantillon, they built a dock along the Hudson River to expedite trade from the area. Well, I just went through the 1777 British attack on Kingston. And while those British ships were coming up the river to reach Kingston, they were tipped off that the Stoutenbergs were staunch patriots. And so in retaliation, they fired the cannons off their ships and totally destroyed that dock that was built for trade there. By the 1870s, the house, uh, the Stoutenburg house in the middle of this, what is now West Market Street was in serious disrepair and it was demolished. At that point, the path leading to the house, the driveway, was expanded on both sides and extended all the way down to the Hudson River and it was named West Market Street and how that's that's how that became uh, its name. Now the family cemetery is located off West Market Street on the north end of Doty Avenue. It's a little cul-de-sac and you'll come to the one acre cemetery. What's interesting is the original entrance for the cemetery was on the north side which actually butts against the Vanderbilt estate for people that have come up here and built the Vanderbilt mansion. And Mr. Vanderbilt was getting more than a little upset that all the family members had a trespass on his estate to access the cemetery. So in 1937, the Stoutenberg Teller Family Association erected this ornate gate and a wall around the entire cemetery. Jacobus and his wife are buried on the west wall in the most northern end of the cemetery, actually very close to the Vanderbilt border. And this cemetery has been maintained meticulously by the Stoutenberg Teller Association, Family Association, since 1942. Next slide. Above the gates is their uh, family crest, which they were very proud of. And I was very proud to address the family association on their annual trip to Hyde Park about four years ago. And we went through their family history. Uh, Jake, uh, Jacobus Stoutenberg is so prominent in the, in the area and the establishment of what is now Hyde Park that he is also featured in the third of a 19 panel mural, next slide, that is inside the Hyde Park Post Office. It was painted by Olin Dow, was a very prominent uh, Rhinebeck artist in the area who also did the murals in the Rhinebeck Post Office. And this building is a treasure in itself because it's one of five WPA post offices that Franklin Roosevelt as president had constructed in his home, Dutchess County. Uh, and I've often told people that you could take a whole day trip and visit the five post offices uh, and see the priceless murals that hang above in the lobbies. I have so many other sites that I could talk about, but I'm, I'm out, of, out of time right now, but I'd love to take some questions if you have any. That was great, Tony. Thank you so much. And um, I, I the, the murals in the post offices, as you probably are aware, they've generated some controversy uh, and there's been some uh, concerns about some of the images that depicted in them, particularly up in Rhinebeck. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, uh, what's happening with the, uh, you know, in today's climate, 
if there is a slave pictured in one of the murals, it's been offensive to some people and they're debating what to do with it. I happen to know already because I, I work for postal headquarters and I, I get an insight into a lot of what's going on today. They have covered already 17 murals across the country. Um, but in my opinion, and I'm not speaking as a postal spokesperson, I'm finished that with that job. Uh, they're covering them with black plastic and trapping the humidity inside these priceless paintings is only going to destroy them. My specific feeling about that is yes, slavery was a bad thing, but like I believe our first speaker today in the festival said, if we don't learn from history, then what is the point? We can't make things better. This was a time when many, many people, in, in, including top politicians, had slaves, and it was a horrible thing. Um, I, I'm kind of opposed to them covering these murals, but if they do have to cover them, I understand the reasons on both sides, but I wish they would bring in art experts to cover them properly so that they don't get destroyed because on the plastic, I would give them six months before they're destroyed. Yes, particularly in the summertime when the humidity up here is very high. Again, I think the murals are historic records. We should contextualize them, provide information, explain what they are de depicting so that people can learn from them rather than just covering them up. It's like pretending that that enslaved peoples didn't exist in the Hudson Valley. Anyway, while we're waiting for the questions from the audience, I have one question for you. And all of the research you've been doing up here, what is the oldest existing building in the Hudson Valley? I have one question for you. And all of the research you've been doing up here, what is the oldest existing building in the Hudson Valley? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, the Freer House on Wilbur Boulevard in uh, the town of Poughkeepsie is the oldest in the town of Poughkeepsie. I would say Slab Sides in Ulster Park, Ulster County, which was the uh, cabin of John Burroughs, is likely one of the oldest. But if you go way up into uh, the area of Kuksaki, that is one of the oldest houses, uh, the Bronx House. And that is open to the public. Uh, it, I know it's a drive to get up there. It's probably only uh, 25 miles south of Albany, but that is the oldest private residence uh, in the entire area. And it's run by the Green County Historical Society. And they give a wonderful tour. And there are five bonds on the property and they've converted each bond into a different kind of history museum. They have a scale model in one of them uh, of the Catskill Mountain House, which of course was the beginning of the, the Catskills becoming a tourist resort area. Uh, another one has the vintage farming tools that we use. They even have a 13 sided hay barn that is still uh, on display on the property and a uh, very interesting place indeed. That's the Bronx. And yes, the Bronx family is related to why the Bronx got its name because they were very prominent down there. I don't know, I come from Brooklyn originally, even though I live here almost four decades, I don't know why we don't say the Brooklyn, but we say the Bronx, just my opinion. Well, it, it looks like we don't have any questions coming in. Um, you did a great job, Tony, as usual. I, your books are so fascinating. My wife and I tour uh, the Hudson Valley a lot. We've used your book to find some very fascinating spots. Um, I just think that all of them really should just be about Roosevelt's, but I understand you need to cover other territory as well. Um, Tony, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having been such a, a great supporter of the library and of this reading festival for, for so many years. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having been such a, a great supporter of the library and of this reading festival for, for so many years. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And uh, when we reopen, your books will be for sale in our store. For so many years. Thank you. Books will be for sale in our store. And that's it for us today here at the um, 
FDR Libraries Hudson Valley History Reading Festival. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, these videos will be available online on our YouTube page and our Facebook. And of course, you can get Tony's books uh, on Amazon.com or when we reopen in our bookstore. I'm Paul Sparrow. Thank you very much for joining us.